Well, hello, everyone. You guys just missed it because I was talking to myself for two minutes thinking I was live. And then uh, Larry's like, man, do are, you know we're not live, right? I'm like, oh. <laughs> so that was funny. I'm glad none of you had to see that. Um, thank you so much, Larry, the hero of the Mandu channel, um, who single-handedly saved us from, from the, the, uh, the evil copyright strike, um, non-do-gooders in Louisiana. Many of you might not be aware of it, but the channel was being struck down. It was off. I didn't know what to do. And out of all people, Larry reached out to me and I'd reach out to a lot of people. Larry reached out to me and he said, Mandy, how can I help? And he was instrumental in saving the channel. Um, so thank you, Larry. I do what I can. Um, and then what the purpose of today is, is that I was uh, watching a, as we do in Mandu, we watch uh, parole and commutation hearings out of Louisiana. And they had a commutation hearing of a man who was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. And for what? For knocking his attorney unconscious in court. Okay, so he was being tried for something completely different. His attorney, whatever it may be, we'll get into it. We'll watch the case and then we'll discuss it. He knocks him out and the DA and the judge, they drop all the charges that he was initially there for and they gave him a life sentence without now, the ability for parole. You're leaving out the best part, Mandu. I mean, it's I wouldn't call it the best part, but like the most iconic, I think, scene in this whole debacle. Because what you're calling knocking out in reality was after getting hit on the side of the head near the, I think it was the left side, um, near the, the skull, the eye socket area, the attorney is laying on the ground unconscious for several minutes, bleeding, ends up laying in a pool of his own blood. They don't even know if they're going to be able to bring him to. Eventually, he comes to and goes to the hospital. So allow me to be a little bit more graphic. This is not just, a, oh, he knocked him out and now he's back. This is like, this was a serious blow to the human body, to the human skull. Like I have not, when I read that, I was not ready for it. That's that's definitely true. It was it was uh, it was not a little uh, backhand slap. It was it was violent. But I think what makes this case particularly interesting and why I wanted to bring you on was what happened at the end of the commutation hearing. So it's more than twenty years later, and the same attorney shows up to keep him locked up in prison for life. And the things that he says struck me as um, as as odd, to say the least. Uh, so I don't know how, how you want to approach this. If you want to watch the, the full hearing and then um, jump in with comments, it's, it's uh, from start to finish. It runs for 37 minutes. Um, I mean, have has your audience seen it before? No, no. We're, I've been waiting to watch it with you. Roll tape. Let's do it. All right. One, two. All right. I have to click this button, right? And I have to fix this. I don't know why this is showing up. This should not be up there because I have the paid version of IV cam. I just ah, haven't used it in a while. Is. But well, you're, you're uh, I guess you're, you're, you know, what's wrong with freemium, right? Right. Well, no, I, I pay for it because I like it. So I don't know why. I guess I have to like reset it or whatever, but ignore it, me. It's like that awkward moment when your Zoom call shuts off 20 minutes in because you're paying, you're not paying for it. Oh, yeah. And you have to restart. I remember those days. <laughs> who said who pays for Zoom? Like uh, who on. pays for Zoom? I know. Um, OK, so let's jump in. Do we have audio? Yeah, this is. Mark? Yes, OK, all right. And both of you want to speak, and we'll call on you at the appropriate time. We'll let them know you're here. OK. OK, are they ready?
All right, we are ready for our next case. Mr. Spano, would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and your DOC number. Good morning, Ms. Renasa. My name is John Spano. My DOC number is 367260, ma'am. Yes, and for the record, I did not state that we are now convening at Louisiana State Penitentiary. And so before we get started on your case, I'd like to have the staff there at Angola. Please introduce yourself for the record. Deputy Warden Rochelle Angola. Reginald Admiral, classification. Jane Babel, offender record. And everybody? Okay. And uh, I'd like to ask your attorney uh, to introduce himself for the record, please. Good morning, Tanner Woods. I'm um, here on behalf of John Spano. Um, thank you for y'all's consideration, and we're excited to meet the case. Okay. And we'll usually do that at the end. Is that okay with you after the interview? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and also here with us in Baton Rouge, Mr. Spano, is family members Mark Peters and Jill Peters. And both of those folks want to speak on your behalf and will ask you to do so at the appropriate time. First, I'm going to just read some identifying information and then we'll start the interview process. Uh, Mr. Spano, you're, as stated, your DOC number is 367260. You're here today seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in October 2006 in the 1st Judicial District, Caddo Parish, as a habitual offender for second degree battery, currently serving a life sentence. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, your case this afternoon has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson. You sounded so proud. Good afternoon, Mrs. Spano. How are you doing? Good afternoon, Ms. Mott Jackson. I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm fine, thank you. How old are you? I am 45, ma'am. When do you make 46? Next month, right? I'm a Yes, ma'am, in August. 11. Yes, ma'am. I'm putting you down for 46, okay? Yes, ma'am. And how much time have you actually served in this case? Uh, in this case, ma'am, I got uh, incarcerated in 2002, so 20, well, almost 20 years. Hey, Mandu, uh, can you pause it real quick? Uh, yes, sir. We actually got a really good question, and I think, um, I don't know about you, but it'll be, I think it would be prudent for our audience to start with this so that people understand what's happening. Let's um, do it. Can you share the screen that I just shared? Okay. So you sent me this. This is the uh, Court of Appeals opinion or a portion thereof of the state versus Spano case. Now, just, just so we're clear, there, there are a couple of moving parts here because Spano was charged with some felony, which I, I haven't gotten into because I literally just received this information from you. Maybe you can fill us in. And he was getting ready to go to trial with his attorney, Ricky Swift. Ricky Swift is the one that ends up getting knocked out by our protagonist here. But before we even get there, I mean, Ricky Swift and Spano are in court getting ready to go to trial. And then all of a sudden, Spano says, well, I have a new lawyer. And then there's kind of like a scuffle and they kind of go back and forth. And they come back to the, the tables, council table. And Spano is like, well, uh, I'm not going to be serving a life sentence or something along those lines. You're not going to give me a life sentence. You're trying to get me a life sentence, something along those lines. And pop, you know, knocks his attorney out, gets charged with second degree uh, assault, uh, gets convicted. That's another felony on his record. Is this hearing directly related to him trying to get on parole for that, uh, the battery, the assault battery, or the original conviction, if and when that happened? Yeah, um, no, I'm glad you asked. So this is this is a commutation hearing. So he was given a life sentence without the ability, uh, possibility for parole. In Louisiana, what they've done, because they've considered it maybe, um, well, they've given the opportunity. So if a board uh, says, you know, we'll recommend a commutation, then the governor signs it, then he has a chance at parole. So right now he sentenced life. He's getting buried under under the jail. So it's even tougher for prison. And that's what this is for. And it's for this specific case. It's for knocking out his attorney. The, the reason why he was going to go to court, those charges were dropped. Now, he was going to court 
not for anything. It, it was for for um, he was accused of 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 sexual assault. He insists Ooh. that he was innocent, um, and that's what his attorney was supposed to to defend him on. Um, but they dropped those charges. So the original basis for this trial that was going to happen on July 12, 2004, those charges have been dropped. Yep. They just said, forget about it. We're not even going to trial. Let's just get them on this. Well, yeah, because you have witnesses. It's literally, in, I mean, the worst place you can commit a crime is inside the courthouse with cameras, with witnesses, bailiffs, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, all watching this whole thing. Uh, I mean, and who's not going to uh, call them on as witnesses? You know what I mean? Um, exactly. okay. So, so that's the, that's the backstory. Okay. Roll tape. Sorry. I just wanted to fill our, our audience in because people had questions and I, I thought it would be prudent. No, please do. This is, this is your show. This is, uh, oh, it's your wanna... show. I, I'm just well, a guest. <laughs> well, you, you're, you're, you're the attorney. So let's, let's bring in as much as your, uh, okay. So let's, uh, where are we here? Bring this back to front. Um, how do I, how do we, oh, here it is. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Good. Okay. So this incident didn't actually happen until 2004. Yes, ma'am. You were incarcerated on the rape charge is that correct that is correct miss jackson which was ultimately dismissed as a result of your being found guilty of second degree battery and being uh, adjudicated as a habitual offender and receiving a life sentence is that correct yes ma'am So oh, you've been in since 2004, actually serving time for this job. Yes, ma'am. Um, so tell us what happened, Mr. Spano, in, in the case that you're incarcerated for right now. Tell us what happened. Ma'am. So that's the attorney that who were blocking's view. What do you want to do? Uh, that's the attorney that he knocked out. Uh, Can that just you? Came in. There's like a, what is it? Control seven, I think. Will put us on the the side of the screen rather than on the bottom. Yeah. So I see. It's either control six or control seven. I can't remember. Let's try. Hopefully this doesn't like whoop. Um. Well, I see this. No. No. No, no, no. There you go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's uh, let's do that. So that's him, Mr. Mr. Swift. And also, since we got Mr. Swift in the picture now, let's take uh, a moment and uh, <laughs> introduce our second protagonist. Um, so Ricky himself, apparently, as uh, you have disclosed to me, which I'm going to share with our audience now. He is also a class act in and of himself. Uh, back in 2014, let's see if we can zoom in here. Mm, no, that's not what I want. You zoom in on this. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, attorney disciplinary proceedings. That is definitely not something you want to see with your name attached to it. I will say that for sure. Um, so per curiam means the entire board of the, uh, disciplinary council in Louisiana, uh, Supreme court of Louisiana is, is sitting. So they have all members. No one is recused or anything like that. The office of disciplinary council commenced an investigation. This is 10 years, mind you, 10 years after the, uh, the knocking out incident. And nine years before we are here today on this hearing that we're going to resume in just a second. So the Office of Disciplinary Counsel commenced an investigation into allegations that respondent, which is Ricky Swift, 
uh, filed a frivolous lawsuit, engaged in conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice, and I believe in his capacity as a public defender, because at the time of the writing and at the time of the incidents, he was a public defender, and he may still be a public defender. I don't know that for a fact, but as of eight years ago, as of the writing of this, um, then it, he was. He still was. Um, he threatened to bring disciplinary charges against another attorney solely. Now, this is the key, okay? So up until this point, you know, filing a frivolous lawsuit, okay, that sucks, you know? Engaged in conduct prejudicial to administrative of just, administration of justice. All right. Threaten to bring disciplinary charges. You either bring them or you don't. You don't threaten them. You can't make it a condition of, if you don't do X, Y, Z, I'm going to file a bar complaint against you. You can't do that. That is an ethical violation, like literally the definition of an ethical violation. If you're going to bring disciplinary action against another attorney, just do it. Don't say you're going to do it. Just do it. And then the the, the bar committee will, will decide what to do. But he did it. Not only did he threaten it, he did it solely to obtain an advantage in a civil case. I mean, literally, when I read that, my first thought was, oh, every scene in that show suits. <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it almost seems like blackmail in a way. It, it doesn't seem like it is, it is blackmail because you're basically saying, look, I need you to do something. No, I'm not going to do that. Well, if you don't, I'm going to bring a disciplinary action against you. You're literally saying I, I have something on you. And if you do, you're under an ethical duty. It's like a catch 22, because now if you know that they uh, have a, a, a committed an ethical violation, you're under a duty to report it. And if you don't report it, well, now you are guilty of failing to report an ethical violation. And if you're threatening that you're going to report an ethical violation, that means that you are automatically guilty of failing to report it as we speak, or you're bluffing both terrible things. And if you're bluffing, that's the blackmail that you're talking about. Now, to be clear, this, this um, what would we call it, an infraction or this uh, strike against him, it, it's not related to this specific case. It's just saying something about this attorney's history. Yes, we're talking simply about Ricky's character and who he is as a person based on this one public reprimand. So they uh, they filed for, uh, formal charges against Ricky and the Office of Disciplinary Counsel, I think, yeah, ODC, Office of Disciplinary Counsel submitted a joint petition for consent discipline. So they're not going to go into detail. They're simply saying, look, it is ordered the petition for consent discipline be accepted and that Ricky Swift, Louisiana bar number such and such, be and hereby is publicly reprimanded. So he's not suspended. He's not disbarred. He is simply, it's like a scolding of the finger. Don't do it again. Everybody knows now. It's all public. Everybody's going to be talking about it. And uh, it's out there. Uh, he is then placed on unsupervised probation for a period of one year. And he has to pay for the costs of this proceeding. Now, I, I, out of curiosity, because um, he, 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 uh, was accepted to the bar in 1985. So it's going on like 37 years or something that he's been an attorney. And I think a, a public defense attorney, is it is it uncommon to have one strike over that, that span of a career? Well, let me put it to you this way. A public reprimand means you crossed the line and you got caught. Um, I think private reprimands are extremely common. Attorneys get privately reprimanded for little things that they do that maybe they shouldn't. And it's not unheard of, um, especially in a 37-year career. I think and I don't want to be defending this man in any way, shape, or form because I don't know anything about him. But I think it's possible that maybe something led to this sequence of events. But here's the bottom line. It doesn't matter how heated the, an argument may be because it may have been just a, in the heat of a moment or something like that. But 
then again, it's a whole frivolous lawsuit that he filed. So it definitely wasn't a heat of the moment. He had to go back home, type up a complaint, read it, reread it, edit it, wait a few more days, look at it again, print it, go to the clerk's office, get it stamped, file it. I mean, it shows very conscious intent. And then to stack on top of it, to come in and say, if you don't X, Y, Z, I'm going to file a bar complaint against you. I mean, that just shows the kind of person you are in my book. There's no coming back from that. Hence the public reprimand. Uh, otherwise, it would have just been swept under the rug. Nobody would care. So in, thir in 37 years to have this strike like that, to me says he probably did maybe similar things before he just didn't get caught. But that's just one fellow's opinion. I have no evidence to support um, one way or the other. So, you know, you're asking me, is it common in 37 year career? I would honestly say no. I know uh, my fellow cohorts who have been practicing, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and have this many strikes against them. So I think this time he simply got caught and maybe he was feeling a bit cocky. Maybe he had a pattern of behavior, let's say, that was just flying under the radar, not crossing the line. And this time he just, you know, crossed over the line and said, all right, we're done. We need to address this. And the opposing, because how did this come about? It's the opposing counsel. Whoever was on the other side of this that he threatened more than likely came forward and said, look, uh, I can't, I can't sit by and, and be silent about this. You just threatened, you know, ethical, uh, filing an ethical complaint against me, I have to go to the bar because you just committed an ethical violation yourself. And if now it, it's almost like I said, it's like a catch 22. If I don't say something, then I'm in trouble. You know what I mean? So it's a very complicated and, and nasty matter and nothing against Ricky. I mean, he seems to be, you know, in 37 years, he seems to be doing all right. So God, well, God speed to him. We're, we're only speculating on a situation like this. <laughs> All, that's um, all we can do that's all, right but let's let's go see i i i think um i, I think you might be onto something it, it is interesting that an attorney would show up 20 years later to keep a man in prison for life for hitting him in my opinion foreshadowing but, much <laughs> um uh the attorney that i had assigned to the case uh filed ready and did all the paperwork they removed that attorney uh, right before trial, which was uh, the weekend. Uh, they assigned me a new attorney, Mr. Ricky Swift. Mr. Swift came and seen me. He explained to me that he just got the case, that he was going to file a motion asking for a continuance because he did not file ready and there was no way that he could properly represent me. He did go in the courtroom and file the motion. They denied the motion. Also. He stood up, and made an oral argument to be removed as counsel because he couldn't properly represent me. At the mm -hmm. time, they denied that motion. When they denied that motion, I let my anger get the best of me, and I punched Mr. Mr. Swift one time, strike him in the face, which I do regret. Well, why? Why were you angry with Mr. Smith? I felt as I did not sense any regret in those he words. Was trying He's to proud of it over me, ma'am, and. Mr. Mr. Swift did everything he could to help me. And at the time, I thought that the DA's office and Mr. Swift was working together, which after looking over the thing, the situation, I realized that Mr. Swift did everything in his power to help me. And I'm sorry for hitting him. No, you're not. Are you hit him once and he fell? Yes, ma'am. Did he hit his head on something? I believe he suffered a cut in uh in above his eye, ma'am, due to the punch. I believe so. I you weren't even paying attention. You don't care about what happened to him. Getting punched, ma'am. Not looking good. So you know, obviously, I've got to ask you about the rape case. Yes, ma'am. Um, what were the accusations against you in the rape case? Ma'am, uh, in that case there, I was dating a young girl 
her fiance was in the military. Uh, in the, the night in question that she said she was raped, uh, it happened in my parents' home. My mother, my father, my sister, and her daughter was at the house. Uh, as you can look at my record, I'm not a good guy. And her husband, her fiance at the time was coming back from the military. And she went and told the sheriff's office that she actually told the, her friend that I had raped her in my parents' home. And I went, did the investigation. I talked to the investigator. Uh, I took drug tests because she said I was on drugs and everything. I passed all that. Uh, I was under full cooperation and it was her word against mine. There was no evidence. The sheriff office arrested me. It's not, a, I didn't do it. There's no evidence. I pled not guilty. I stayed not guilty <laughs> for Christ, almost two years, ma'am, going back and forth to court. And I'm still not guilty of that charge, ma'am. I did not sexually assault that lady. Well, there he says it. At no time. Oh. I, I hear a lot of hesitance in those All words. Right. Well, you're actually, you know, they ultimately dismissed the rape charge, and it may have been because you received a life sentence in this case. But I'm not going to speculate on, you know, the under the, the merit of the underlying charge because I don't. Have that information. So, what did you me. ask about it if you don't? I care. do say just wanted to hear that in 1996, you had an aggravated battery where you received a four year sentence. What was that about? Miss oh, so Jackson, got a history that was of battery. a fight uh, in high school. I was my senior year. Actually, 1995 should have been the date of arrest. Uh, He's a recidivist. How old were you in 1995? I was I was a juvenile. I was 17 years old, ma'am. And school. what happened in the fight that caused you to get an aggravated battery charge? Uh, me and a couple of my friends was out. Uh, we stopped at a gas station. We had got into a fight with a group of guys. There was a chain and a tire tool. Some of the guys got hit with uh, different weapons. Uh, I threw a chain with a lock and hit a guy with it, and that caused me to get aggravated battery. I received four. I pled guilty of four years hard labor, ma'am. So you were not probated. You actually served four years in prison. Yes, ma'am. I never had probation. But you you did not get a suspended sentence. I no, wouldn't I'm, call him a career criminal. Also, he just has a hot temper. That, he just doesn't know how to control himself. To a juvenile. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in the process of the fight, there was a lady and a child at a red light. Someone hit the child. Uh, I took full responsibility for it. The lady said she could not identify no one. Hey, well, uh, someone, you know, either you hit the child or, or you hit, you, you did it or you didn't. So I, 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 I did do it because it was my actions that caused the fight, ma'am. So what happened to the child? Um, uh, in the process of fighting, uh, the child got struck at the red light. Oh. Uh, like I said, it was a bunch of us fighting, and the child got hit. The child got struck at a red light. Was the child in a car? Yes, ma'am. And the vehicle that the child was in got struck? No, ma'am. Uh, I reached in the car and hit the child. There was another person in the car, and the child got hit in the process. Now it makes sense. So one of the people that you were fighting with, I had been fighting with, was in the vehicle? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. All right. And then in 2000, you had a simple battery. Yes, ma'am. What was that about? You got mm. days in Paris jail for that. And what, what was the date, ma'am? It's 2000. <laughs> so it means there was more than those three, if he doesn't remember the date. You played guilty to a simple battery and you got 30 days. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. ma'am. That Go was ahead. that was a fight in uh in the city jail. Uh, I pled guilty to 30 days. I was in the city jail doing time for a uh, traffic ticket and another violation, and had a fight while I was in the city jail with another offender. Uh, you also had in 98, you had a simple burglary where you got 15 months in DOC. What was that about? Uh, me and my girlfriend uh, jumped the fence at a man's house out in the country and trespassed on his land and went into his cabin and was swimming. Uh, nothing was vandalized. We, uh, the sheriff department, got called and come and arrested me for a uh, simple burglary. Burglary of what? <laughs> it was a, it was a hunting camp, uh, a fishing camp. Well, that's not bad. Okay. I thought he was going to say, and then he like knocked his cow unconscious. And then I saw another simple battery that had started off as a second degree battery. It got reduced to simple battery, and that was in 1998. Remember that? Yes, ma'am. That, that Miss Jackson, that one there was a also a fight in a city jail. I was locked up doing time for something else and had a fight in a city jail and with another offender. Oh, why so many uh, fights? Why so many crimes of violence? Ma'am, uh, for as long as I can remember, I had a problem with losing my temper. Uh, most of the time, dealing with arguments, and arguments lead to uh, me getting into fights. I learned uh, that was a main trigger in my uh, arguments was was caused my temper to have outbursts and everything, and I would get real upset. So with self-help programs and I learned how to control it, help people instead of having disagreements, hands. listen to people. He's just anxious. He just wants to get out of there. Figure out why you were what so do I need to say? Ma'am, I had the, my bitterness and everything usually came from arguments and disagreements and like I so said, you're never going to argue and disagree as, as soon as you get out of here? Sorry, can you pause this real quick? I don't want to talk over this guy. Well, you know, they do. They show do of hands. It. Show of hands. Who who does not believe a word that this guy says? I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I'm going to call a spade a spade. Who here? <laughs> Raise your hand. If you don't believe a single word that comes out of this man's mouth. Whoa. We, well, I could, I, I can make a poll. We can, uh, we can see. You know, it's, it's interesting. What I find fascinating about these hearings is that you go through a flow of questions, and 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 your opinion might change, um, because we're going to learn things about his record. You know, if they're going to ask him how many fights has he gotten into in the last twenty years in Angola, and maybe his answer is going to surprise you. No, sure. I'm not I'm saying at this juncture, 14 minutes and 32 seconds into the video, at this moment, cuz I can't predict the future. You're absolutely right. But like my my spidey sense is tingling. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it, it, everything that this man says is literally designed to get him the most favorable result with this board right here, right now, so I can go back to business as usual. There is no rehabilitation in my mind. Again, my own opinion. This is just my opinion as uh, a, a make-believe board member on the Louisiana Parole Board. Yeah, no, it's 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 fascinating. We're all gonna, you know, the opinion may or may not change as it goes. And just for the FYI, it's not it's not a fifty-six minute long hearing. It's um, so it's only about like another fifteen minutes longer, and then we can go into more commentary. But uh, it, it's, yeah, I want to uh, hear what the attorney has to say because apparently he says a couple of things. It, that is what we're looking forward to. But let's see. Let's. I'm curious, if, and I'll I'll run a poll on 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 the chat and see what what everyone else thinks. Dangerous. I'm trying to figure out. What are you uh, 
Who were you angry? I mean, why so much anger? I didn't I didn't have anger, ma'am. It was mostly uh my temper. Temper and anger are the same thing. What do you mean? Well, I would lose my temper at different things and at arguments and disagreements. I learned how to control it. And how do you control it? Tell me how you control it. I control my temper, ma'am, by positive thinking. I listen to people now instead of arguing. I offer self-help and I learned that you don't have to argue or disagree with somebody. You don't have to result in violence, that you can be a better person. I did so see coach. that you've only had one write up that was in 2009, it was for a contraband. What was that about? That was stamped envelopes, ma'am. I had in my possession stamped envelopes. Where'd you get them? I got them out the canteen. Purchased them? Yes, ma'am. They sold them in the canteen? Yes, ma'am. Why was that contraband? Because they said the amount that I had in my locker box. How many did you have? I had, I believe, 400 and something. Okay. Why'd you have so many? Mailing hobby craft out, writing letters. Guys get stamps and don't need them. Give them to me. I wrote a lot of letters, mailed a lot of hobby craft out to my family. I did not realize that they was contraband, and they actually gave the stamped envelopes and everything back to me after I pled guilty in court. Uh, you've been a minimum a trustee since. So that I'm not sure I believe because st stamps is a currency. So if you have 400, I think it means he's probably trading it or running the store. It's 2015, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. What's your job at the prison right now? I work maintenance, ma'am. Specifically, what do you do? Air conditioning, refrigeration, and carpentry. Okay. Uh, and I do see that you got a letter of commendation from the maintenance department supervisor. Yes, ma'am. So he's got good work ethic. You also have um, very positive remarks on your institutional record. So I see you've only taken, a, correct me if I'm wrong, you've taken 100 hours of free relief, cage or raise, and living in balance one and two. Yes, ma'am, and I am currently taking thinking for a change. How long have you been involved? Living in balance with the substance abuse program. Um, what, what were your substance abuse issues? My substance abuse issues was drinking, ma'am. How old were you when you started drinking? Uh, say 15, 16, hanging out with older friends. What, what, what kind of drinking did you do? Mainly beer, ma'am. How often were you drinking? Uh, usually on weekends, Ms. Jackson. Did you uh, ever progress to other alcohol or to drugs or to more frequently than on weekends? No, ma'am, it never progressed to drugs. I had never had a drug problem. But once I got older, I started going out uh, after work, drinking with friends on weekdays and stuff like that, Ms. Jackson, but never heavy drinking. How many days a week did you go out drinking? Maybe two, three days a week. Plus weekend? Plus weekend, yes, ma'am. What do you call heavy? That sounds kind of heavy to me. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm heavy drinking is like what I would say, drink all night long. I wouldn't oh, do that God. because I always had a job. I would go out for a couple of hours, drink, and then and go home. Well, what did you learn about your, your drinking habits and living in balance? Ma'am, I learned that even social drinking 
can be a problem if it's not controlled. I learned that he's a binger when you uh, social drink. And as I did, if there was an argument or anything like that, it would lead to me getting into a fight or me leaving a, a bar or someone's house mad or losing friends over that. So I learned that I attend classes uh, weekly here in Angola uh, and express that and help other people dealing with that. And they helped me. I did learn that, ma'am. So you do He's see just, a I did learn that. Like, get off my back. And anger and temper. Yes, ma'am. So how do you plan to avoid that? If per, to prevent that, ma'am, pe- put myself around positive people, uh, continue go to church, continue uh, working, and just avoid drinking, period. I, that should have been your first answer, in my life. Dumbass. It's been uh, destroyed most of my life, ma'am. Well, how, how are you going to be able to avoid drinking? Because you your friends are going to want to go out. You'll be in social events with your family. It'll be beer and maybe I'll do liquor. How, how are you going to avoid Great drinking? Question. It's going to be all around you. Well, ma'am, I can avoid it by drinking Coke, drinking Dr. Pepper, drinking water. I do not have to socialize with people and drink. I have learned that. I do I not. He's distancing himself. I water. will not is the right answer. I do not I have to do that. Like AA I will. Or NA. We, we do an AA program uh, nightly at Camp F, ma'am. Wow. Go, go ahead. I go up there and fellowship with the guys and fellowship with them outside of the AA. You say, they, when you say fellowship with them. Thanks, Bojan. I mean, sit down, talk, discuss problems, discuss different situations. I know that's not how you pronounce your name. I just uh, like saying that. So you're actually participating in the AA meeting? Yes, ma'am. You think AA or NA is something that is important for you uh, on the outside? I think AA is, ma'am, and I think people with positive outlooks and on life and just in general is church. I attend church services. Cowboys for Christ at Camp Elf. There's all kind of services that have positive things in them. How important do you think it is to attend AA meetings? As a part of your plan to maintain sobriety. I think it's real important, ma'am. I mean, so tell me, because when I asked you what was your plan, you kind of didn't mention AA, you mentioned church and I people didn't hear you mention AA as being part of that sobriety plan. Well, uh, church, uh, the, the 12 step program is, it's church based and it's founded on that. So church, AA uh, is, uh, goes hand in hand. I do Think that both of them are, are real positive. I'm a, if if released, I will attend both of them, ma'am, because I need that. Notice how so, oh pause pause talk about pause transition pause. up until mm-hmm. this point. Notice how this is extremely important. Um, I notice witnesses do this all the time, especially cops on the stand. His hands have been on the table the entire time, almost the entire time for the last 24 minutes. As soon as he said, I'm going to be going to church, if released, ma'am, his hands immediately went under the table. He's hide, like he's hiding something. He's he's lying. That's that's a very telling language, by the way. Um, not It's not guaranteed, but it's when something like so extreme happens in body language where he's been doing the same thing for 23 minutes. And for the first time we hear words like if released, I'm going to do X, Y, Z and his hands disappear. That is a, that is a 100% pay attention. 
Uh, I, I I didn't. You know, you have much more experience. I, I'm I'm not a body language guy, but I I thought maybe he's just starting to feel comfortable. So he's you know you're less stiff. No, when you're comfortable, yeah. you're going to be doing this. You're going to be showing the palms of your hands. I have nothing to hide. The the first thing he does, he takes his hands and he puts them under the table where you can't see them. That is deceptive language. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, but that's again, it, it, it's you can never rely on body language as an tell all and be all like you're not gonna you know use that to crucify someone but it's definitely an element to be paying attention to for these things i i noticed that immediately i mean i don't know if anybody else in the audience has, has caught that but that was just so and and that is the first time he said anything about if released did you catch that well, that's true it's um well i guess we'll <laughs> I, I wonder if they will release him on this note too but yeah i've seen i've seen it i've seen hearings that have gone much worse um I, I think like this is probably like somewhere in the middle like not a one not a 10 maybe a five um just because i've seen over 600 hearings and believe me they can get they can be so much worse than this um oh i'm which, sure they, yeah. i mean this guy's keeping it together listen don't get me wrong I, I have not had as much experience watching these as you have. That's for damn sure. But I will say from this one, watching this one, like you said, uh, he's most certainly keeping it together. And he's definitely got, he knows what are the right things that he needs to say in order to at least have a shot at getting out. But the problem is what he is missing is the human element behind it because it probably doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> No, no offense to him. I mean, if it was there, we would hear it, you know. Like, I, I, I want to bring you to – have you seen Shawshank Redemption? Of course. Okay, of course, right? <laughs> I would imagine yeah. you would. Right. Do you remember Red's hearing the third one that he did? So right, yeah. For yeah. those unfamiliar with the movie, it is about a man who is – allegedly wrongfully convicted but we don't know that until much 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 later in the movie and without spoiling because there I, I even saying that i still have not spoiled the movie because it's a phenomenal flick and i urge every single one of you to watch it there's another main character played by morgan freeman and his name is red and he's in prison for is it murder i can't remember uh red room maybe <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Morgan Freeman's character, he plays him so well. His name is Red, and he's basically like, he gives up hope. He's like, I'm going to be in this prison forever. I'm never going to get out. He has a parole hearing every like five, ten years. And each time, if you listen to the words, if you listen to the, the, the emotion behind the words, like the first time he appears before the parole board, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm rehabilitated. No question, ma'am. No question about it. I am I am 100% a hundred percent a changed man. Let's go do this, you know. And then I think they do another one, and then the third time. And again, this I won't spoil because an event happens that changes Red's perspective on life. Uh, a couple of events actually happen. He has a conversation, and then an event happens with our main protagonist, and um, he has that final hearing. And you have to watch the movie and it's like the raw emotion that is felt behind the words all of a sudden, because we genuinely feel his words. We don't just hear them like with, um, Mr. Uh, what's his name? Sp Sp uh, Spock. I forgot his name. Um, who the, the, uh, the Spoke? Spano. Yeah. Yeah. Spano. Um, Spano. Uh, John, John, I guess his first name is John, but they're calling him Mr. Spano. Mr. Spano. So Spano, like I, I hear him. I am listening to his words, but I don't feel his words. They just like they're landing on on sand rather than water. No, no. I well, I I, I do agree with that. There, there are certain people that are very charismatic in these hearings, and he's more um, reciting and uh, his his. I I do agree. successful where would you live where would you work how would you support yourself ma'am uh i have a skilled trade of heating air conditioning refrigeration uh i also have an epa hazard chemical license that goes with the refrigeration 
I have a resident plan at my sister and brother-in-law's house. I also have a job reference plan with a guy that owns a construction company. I would support myself by getting a job with him and I would live with them. Them, them being? My sister, Mark Peters, my sister, Jill Peters, and my brother-in-law, Mark Peters. Warden, what can you tell us about Mrs. Spano? Okay, I can tell you that Mrs. Spano is a class A trustee. He uh, has worked outside detail. He has uh, did renovations at the governor's mansion, and he's also when LCIW was moving to Jetson, he was part of the work crew that uh, that renovated the uh, Jetson compound for the women to be transferred there. Um, he helps with renovation of houses and repairs of houses on the B line for the uh, B line community. And he also do air condition uh, repair, uh, and he is uh, an AA. Um, only one DB report, and it was the one that you spoke of. And I heard him say that they gave him his stamps back, but they only gave him the $50 uh, allotted limit for the stamps. Um, the rest of them, they, uh, they confiscated. All right. That's all I have, Ms. Okay, thank you. Um, I have just a couple questions for you, Mr. Stan. I'm just listening to you. Tell us, when's the last time you got angry? The last time I got angry was about three months ago, ma'am. And I got angry because uh, it was at a job and we was doing an install and somebody wanted to do things their way because their way seemed easier for them. And it would have been easier for me to do it my way. But I compromised with them and let them do it their way and eventually got the system hooked up and then came back later on and showed them how the book says do it and explained to them after everything got calmed down i resolved the situation by doing that thinking instead of acting all right good so i was going to ask you the last time you disagreed with someone but i guess that was it Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. What kind of hobby craft do you do? I, I do metal work, ma'am. Okay. Metal, jewelry. All right. I don't have any other questions. And I, and I want to uh, acknowledge that we have also on Zoom your sister, Miss Diane Sprayberry. Sister. We'd like to hear from you now, ma'am. Hello. Yes. What would you like us to know? I would like you to know that he means a lot to all of his family and that we know that over the years that he has changed and he has tried to do better. Um, and that he is very family oriented. And I would like for you to know that if he, if he is granted his pardon or parole, that we will do everything that we can to help our brother stay on the right track. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your remarks today. And we'd like to hear from Thanks. this. That was really short. Sister. Could you step up to the podium? Thank y'all for the speaker today. Uh, I just want to say that we think that John needs a second chance because he's done so good and ain't only been there 23 years. He's been very good. Um, got all the certificates, so I think he's ready to be out in the world to show what he's got. And we'll take care of him, don't you worry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Peter. Thank you for coming today, and uh, I just want you to know, thank you all in the system for changing this man, making him a real man, instead of a young, angry boy. And we have seen it every time we go down there, we get Acknowledge how good he is and how well he participates with everything. And the system does work, whether people do it or not. He's living proof of it. And I just want to thank y'all for giving us this chance. Thank you. Thanks for being here. We do Ricky have just also like, on Zoom. Oh, oh. Um, Give me my turn. Give me my turn. It's actually Sorry. no, but it's actually refreshing when they they go through the three supporting statements. It's all under a minute. Sometimes. 
they just ramble on about nothing and it's actually doesn't help anyone. Fair, so, fair. Yeah. Respect. Ricky Swift. Here we go. Yeah, he's still there. I have an indication that he does not want to speak, uh, but I will oh. give you that opportunity, Mr. Swift, if you'd like to say a few words. He does not want to speak. You're, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I would just like to say um, briefly uh, in 30 seconds or less that uh, I did represent Mr. Spano and I heard what he said. Uh, I would differ that I was not prepared, but I was trying to assist him in getting his case continued because that was his request. Uh, however, uh, many times they defended We'll wait to the last minute and tell the court that they plan on hiring a, an attorney. And that was actually the situation that the day of trial, uh, Mr. Spano announced to the court that he was hiring an attorney. And the court gave him an opportunity to have that attorney come in and represent him. Of course, that didn't happen. So therefore, the court denied the continuance based on it was an attempt to delay the trial. And lastly, I would like to delay let tactics. the panel know that uh, Mr. Spano had every opportunity to go to trial and prove that he was not guilty of this rape. The reason he hit me is because he knew the evidence against him was overwhelming, that he would be convicted, that once he's convicted, I informed him that he would be multi bill and receive a life sentence. And that's why he panicked because he really didn't want to, want to go to trial. So he was looking for a way out and his way out was to hit me in order to avoid oh. being convicted of the rape. So that's oh all I want to say. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. So it was not as bad as you painted it, but it's a different kind of bad man, dude. Because you you painted it as a different picture in our in our conversation. I thought it was going to be a whole lot worse than this. Um, delay tactic. Let me commit another felony just so that I don't have to go to trial on this felony. I mean, this guy is something else. Um. It, and for some reason, I actually believe believe Ricky um, because it, it, it actually makes sense in a way because he has a history of violence. He knows that the way to solve an argument is by punching the other guy harder than he punches you. And it's a solution to problems in the man's head. Unfortunately, it's, again, not judging him, simply trying to assess what's probably going on in his head as an individual. Uh, he gets angry. He gets frustrated. He got angry in court because he, he was like, my lawyer is not prepared. I, I don't want to go to trial. If I go to trial today, I'm going to lose because my lawyer doesn't give a shit about me. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's the truth or not. He believed it. And therefore, it was his truth. And so when he saw Ricky like getting his, you know, his papers together and getting ready to go to trial in his head, um, uh, Spano is sitting there going, uh, we're going to lose. I'm going to go to prison because Ricky admitted just now. He said, I warned Spano that there's overwhelming amount of evidence against him. You uh, will get convicted and you're going to get a sentence. And uh, meanwhile, Spano is sitting there going, all right, Ricky doesn't care about my case. He's not going to be representing me to the best of my ability, uh, to the best of his ability. I'm probably going to get convicted. I need to find a way out of here. Uh, and especially because I think in the we, we didn't really read this part, but in the opinion, I believe the court stated that uh, the delay tactics. So there were two delay tactics attempted. One failed and the other one succeeded. The first delay tactic that Spano tried to implement and Ricky just mentioned it is, Your Honor, I hired new counsel the morning of trial. All of a sudden, you don't wait a week before, a month before, a day before. The morning of, jury's about to walk in. Your Honor, Mulligan, we got to start over. I just hired new counsel. Um, that's delay tactic attempt number one. And the court to that said, if you read the opinion, uh, uh, the portion that I read, this is where it says in the, in the facts, that the court was going to say, no problem, you can have your own attorney, but the trial is still going today. The trial is still going to go today. If you read under facts, 
Um, I believe uh, I saw it somewhere because I read it. Um, and so after that, after that fails, so a, a new attorney is going to come in, uh, uh, it's not going to work. What is my second best option? Oh, if I punch a lawyer out, commit a new crime, we can't proceed forward. And so that's his, unfortunately, it's not committing. Somebody called him a career criminal. I don't think he's a career criminal. I really disagree with that statement. Uh, I think he is, I don't even think he's a bad man. I don't think his intentions are bad. I think he is a good man with a good heart who just does not know how to control his temper and simply uses violence as a means to an end to accomplish his goal. So when somebody disagrees with him, somebody makes him angry, his reaction is to use physical violence to get what he needs. Maybe he was abused as a child. Maybe um, he grew up in an environment where that was the norm. Maybe he was part of a gang. I, I don't know. I have no clue. But this is starting to like, I'm seeing the picture. I'm seeing the like more and more and more of this picture now. And I think Swift has really, Ricky Swift, his former attorney, has really filled in whatever gaps were missing. And that is it was a delay tactic strategy and that makes complete sense that's why i believe him so um, well, my question my question is for, because what i heard was his attorney saying i told him that he's he's going to get prosecuted he's going to get an, an habitual offender he's going to go away for life and that's why he hit me and as a defense attorney you're aren't you supposed to believe your client his client saying no I, i'm i'm innocent uh there's a difference between believing your client is innocent and believing your client is going to get convicted. Um, I may believe my client is innocent, but knowing there is overwhelming amount of evidence that is going to convict my client, no matter what I believe. Sometimes you believe your client is guilty and you still represent them because the state doesn't have enough evidence. You don't believe the state's going to prove your client's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That is the polar opposite of the statement you just made. So you got to think of it this way. Uh, you know, my favorite phrase that I like to use, just because you did it does not mean you're guilty. Let that marinate for a second. I'm going to say it again. Just because you did it does not mean you're guilty. And that phrase, there's a lot to unpack there. But in a nutshell, it basically means you may have committed the act. You you consciously know you maybe you told your attorney, whatever, but the state can't prove it. But the state doesn't have enough to prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And so you're going to win at a trial, even though you have committed the offense, but there's no way to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the flip side to that is a uh, there's a very famous case. It is also known uh, uh, in the legal world as an Alford plea. Have you ever heard of the case of State v. Alford, Mandu? Um, I, I, I've heard it like contextually, but... If... It, it's very simple. It, it was a man accused of committing a murder. I believe it was a murder. I'm pretty sure it was a murder. He sweared up and down, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. Wrong place, wrong time, too much evidence. And because he said this uh, new arm of the law was created... I am going to plead guilty to the offense, said Alfred, but I maintain my innocence. It is the most insane construct of law that has ever been created, uh, short of like Miranda and, and um, maybe a couple others I can think of that can warp reality, like the Fourth Amendment even. Um it is basically him saying the state has so much evidence against me. And if this goes to trial, I am 100% going to lose. I'm going to get convicted. I'm going to get the max sentence. But I didn't do it. I maintain my innocence. Uh, practically speaking, an Alfred plea has absolutely zero effect on your sentencing at the end of the day. You're going to get the same sentence that you agreed to uh, with the prosecution that the court, assuming the court accepts it. Um you're going to have the full force of a guilty plea. I guess the thing you do get to say, because we've had, uh, you know, sometimes a, a client will plead to uh, like a speeding charge, extremely, 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 extremely rare. 
but they're like, I did not do it, but I'll just plead it to, you know, get it off my back and get it over with. We had a lawyer in the courthouse. Uh, he was, God bless him. Uh, he, he always boasted about the one time he got an Alfred plea on a speeding charge. Cause that was, that was his claim to fame. And it was like his favorite story to tell. Um, and you know, it, it, it's, it, it, it has no real effect on on the plea itself and the sentencing itself but you can go around saying yeah i pled pursuant to alfred if you're like apply for employment i pled pursuant to alfred which means you know you can honestly say i pled i maintained my innocence but there was overwhelming evidence of guilt against me so i decided to just take a deal and you can't not every plea can be turned into an alfred plea if the prosecution doesn't agree if the court doesn't agree you will not get an Alfred plea pushed through. Um, so we've we've pled uh, some clients pursuant to Alfred in in my office in my career. It's extremely rare, but again, it, it's one of these things. And I'm coming back to it, man, dude, because you asked a very fascinating question. You know, the way you phrased it to me yesterday was like something along the lines of uh, the attorney himself believed his client was guilty. I don't think so. I actually disagree with that statement. It doesn't, Ricky did not use any words to denote that he believed uh, Aspano was guilty. To the contrary, he warned him. He stated that he warned him of the potential consequences of going to trial. He warned Spano of the amount of evidence uh, against his client. He warned him that he might be spending the rest of his life in prison if he goes to trial and doesn't take the plea or whatever. He warned Spano of all these things. And again, we're coming back to the same question. What is Spano's response when he is angry and he's unhappy with the results and he's not getting what he wants? He uh, he throws a, a, a dinger. You know, there, there, there was... Um... There, there was a case with, with the uh, with the Alfred plea that, that I saw in the Louisiana parole hearing, which did upset me. And that was someone who had, um, a, we call them cockroaches on this channel, a chomo, someone who, who harmed a child. And he took an Alfred plea and the DA let him. And I was upset with that because I said, the victim wants to be believed, right? Um, so I was surprised that they allowed in that case for him to take the Alfred plea. Um, but it's an interesting point of view. I, 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 when I had first seen this, I thought, I thought with that, I thought that he, you know, that's what I reached out to. I said, this, his attorney comes 20 years later and then says he didn't even trust his client, but let's listen to it again. I, and I, I will even break it down if you want, like yeah, not with every like constituent part, but like the main, the main pillars, I think of Mr. Swift's testimony. That opportunity, Mr. Swift, if you'd like, to can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I would just like to say um, briefly uh, in 30 seconds or less that uh, I did represent Mr. Spano and I heard what he said. Uh, I would differ that I was not prepared, but I was trying to assist him in getting his case continued because that was his request. So uh, pause right however, there. So I was uh, trying to many, get the case continued because that was his request. My client told me I don't want to go to trial today. Let's get it continued. Let's get a new date. And I will do that for you, Mr. Spano. And he asked the court. Court says no continuances. We already know that. We're moving to jury trial this morning, counsel. Let's go. Because that was his request. Uh, however, uh, many times they defend it. We'll wait to the last minute and tell the court that they plan on hiring a, an attorney. And that was actually the situation. Okay, pause. Wow. So it was a delay tactic, and he's explaining that to the board. It was Spano's attempt to buy more time. Right. Uh, Mr. Spano announced to the court that he was hiring an attorney, and the court gave him an opportunity to have that attorney come in and represent him. Of course, that didn't happen. So therefore, the court denied the continuance based on it was an attempt to delay the trial. To and lastly, I would like to let the panel know that uh, Mr. Spano had every opportunity to go to trial and prove that 
he was not guilty of this rape. The reason he hit me is because he knew the evidence against him was overwhelming, that he would be convicted. Okay, pause right there. I see what you're saying. He knew the evidence against him was overwhelming. Is still not a conscious, in my opinion, a conscious admission that um, of like his client's guilt. He's saying his client knew. He's not saying I knew. He's not breaching attorney-client confidentiality. He's saying he has been given every opportunity to go to trial. He knew the evidence against him is overwhelming. Now he's about to launch into, and I told him how bad it's going to look and what the potential consequences are. So, yeah, roll tape. Once he's convicted, I informed him that he would be multi-bill and receive a life sentence. And that's why he panicked. He because warned he him. really didn't want to. But what was he, what was he telling him to do? He, well, I mean, I, I still see it from him saying he hit me because I told him they're going to find you guilty. And when they find you guilty, you're going away for life. You're telling a 20 something year old kid this. And, uh, and that's why he hit me. And if I'm sitting there innocent and Larry, I got to tell you, I take this personally because I was falsely accused of doing something. Okay. And I found myself in a cell with two detectives on a Sunday morning and I watched enough law and order to know, to ask for an attorney. And I was 1010% completely innocent. So with that in mind, I couldn't be a jury on his trial. Right. But I have certain perspectives and views where, um, where I just have a different perspective. I, 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 uh, so, and, and because of that, I'm going to, you know, I might believe him. Um, but I wouldn't want my attorney telling me you're going to be found guilty and you're going away for life. He didn't say that though. He said there is an overwhelm. See, you got to be careful. The Mr. Swift said that he told his client that there is an overwhelming uh, amount of evidence against him. He never said, dude, you're guilty. What are you doing? He never said that. Uh, first of all, that doesn't even make sense because there's only two entities that can find you guilty, and that is a jury or a judge, depending on if you do a bench trial or a jury trial. So overwhelming evidence of guilt, and you have to separate in your mind fact from law because I know it's not easy. For a lawyer, it's extremely easy because we do it every day. So bear with me. So in his mind, Ricky knows what happened because his client told him whether he believes it or not is completely irrelevant to the equation. On the law side of things, Ricky knows that the standard in court is beyond a reasonable doubt, guilty or not guilty. Um, well, beyond a reasonable doubt, guilty or the opposite, not guilty. There is no standard on the not guilty. So on the law side of things, Ricky looked at the evidence, saw what the state has, knew what they're going to bring forth, assessed how a jury is going to look at it without bringing any emotion, bias, judgment, personal opinion into the matter, and assessed that uh, Spano is going to get convicted by a jury of 12. And if he is going to get convicted, they're going to give him the life sentence the maximum sentence, which is life. Therefore, there is no uh, reason to go to trial. And what other alternatives do we have? There's probably a plea deal on the table. Dude, take the plea deal. Maybe it was five years, 10 years, 20 years. I don't know what it is. But whatever the deal was, he was probably urging Spano to take it. Spano said, no, I'm not taking the deal. I want to go to trial. So Ricky did his due diligence, as any public defender would, and said, look, man, if you are convicted, and I just told you there's over overwhelming evidence of guilt against you, again, what I personally believe doesn't matter, and what you personally believe doesn't matter, it's what the state has. You with me? I I, I, I am with you, and I'm going to bring something up once you're done. So, yeah. sure. And so, finally, the, the Spano said, I'm going to trial, and when he realized, uh, I'm just going to keep delaying, 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 his first delay tactic didn't work, we're back to square one punch him in the face and we're good. I bought myself more time. But I saw your uh, your your last uh, YouTube video that you loaded telling secrets and you said you're supposed to take it all the way to trial up into the last moment and then take a plea deal. So mm -hmm. 
That's not exactly what I said. You should always set your cases for trial to overload the system. <laughs> but I didn't say he was going to go go to trial. That's a different ballgame. There's a difference right. between setting it for trial and maybe you should go to trial uh, if you think you can win. Sure. But here you're gambling with a man's life. And if the state has enough evidence to convict, it's probably not a good idea to take it to trial. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that that does make sense. Um, and the client is, at the end of the day, the arbiter of the case. They get the final say whether or not you're going to trial or not. So, But also, you're forgetting the, the last piece here. Because, and I, I don't think I mentioned it, because Swift was firmly convinced that he was going to lose, and unfortunately, he projected his lack of confidence in Spano's case to him, that is the real reason why he got hit at the end of the day. It was a delay tactic mixed in with probably what Spano felt was justified. Like, dude, you're not fighting for me. You don't believe in me. You don't believe in my case. We're going to lose. Uh, I don't want to go to prison. And I'm just going to go to prison for something else, I guess. I don't know. Hey, and that is the flip side. Imagine if he actually was innocent and he just sat in jail for two years waiting for this trial and his family's supposed to buy him an attorney, but they don't. And then he's stuck with this public defender who then looks at him and says, you're going to go, you're right. If you have an anger problem, you might knock out your attorney too. Could, could go both ways. Um, it's a crazy, crazy situation, all, no matter how you look at it. And the bottom line is he does show up 20 years later to keep this man locked up in prison, which... Well, I I, again, I don't know if he is exactly, I wouldn't phrase it that way personally. Uh, I would simply say that he's, all he's trying to do is to be there and voice his opinion. I, 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 would you really go so far as to say he's there to keep, make sure the man doesn't get out? I think he just corrected the record on, based on what he said, what, based on what Spano said about Swift. Well, he I don't know. He, I mean, he is showing up at his hearing. So in he objection. was an involved party. Well, let's He's see. a victim. I can't remember if he mentions it. I don't know. I, I'm just I'm just stating what I see, man. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Want to go to trial, so he was looking for a way out, and his way out was to hit me in order to avoid being convicted of the rape. So that's all I want to say. Yes, sir. And we did receive your victim impact statement that you submitted earlier. We have that in the record. All right, um, before we turn it over to Mr. Woods, Mr. Spano, is there a statement you'd like to make? Ma'am, the statement that I'd like to make is, uh, I am on the backlog list for victim awareness. Uh, if I would have completed that course, like I did, I did apologize to Mr. Swift. I want Mr. Swift to know that I am truly sorry for hitting him and disappointing my family, ma'am. The people that care oh. about me the most, I let them down. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Woods. Thank you all. Let me start by talking a little bit about who Mr. Shana was. This is his attorney now. Yes, and yeah. I haven't known him for all that long. We just recently got hired. But I feel like I know him from the conversations that I've had with him already. I, I also grew up in the Shreveport area, and so I, I, I feel like I know this area. I know kids that went to Southwood High School like Mr. Spano, and I will say that most of the, the, the kids that I know from Southwood High School got into a fight or two in high school. That was, it, it is a very country sort of rural school, and, and fights happen, things like that happen, and I have no doubt that Mr. Spano, and I'm sure that he would agree with me, that he was a rowdy, rambunctious, you know, high school kid. He got into some fights. He made some stupid mistakes. And his his brother-in-law, who's actually been now with his, with Jill for a little over thirty-eight years, has been with him since John. They've been together since John was twelve. He was one of the main you know role models for John. He was telling John all along, you know, that you got to stop this. You got to stop getting in all these fights. You got to be getting in trouble. At one point, I think he even. Kind of predicted the future and said, you know, if we're getting in trouble, something bad's going to happen. You're going to wind up in jail for a trouble. Mr. Spano, unfortunately, didn't learn that lesson early enough. 
um, and he found himself on trial. And I, I just want to go back to that morning, or, or the what evening way to before, it. the first time that he's ever met Mr. Ricky Slim, his defense attorney, he's going to trial for an aggravated rape charge the next morning. Mr. Stam knows, and he's got six witnesses. He was talking about him here today. He's got six witnesses, two of which were out of state. Um, and kind of been filing motions indicating that they needed time to get the, the two witnesses from out of state here, and then he had four witnesses that were in town. He had a defense that he wanted to present. Mr. Ricky Swift had not been on the case long enough to understand that defense. And he came. He came. The motion for continuance was denied. The motion for withdrawal was denied. And he came. He made the, the worst decision of his life. I, I would ask y'all to not hold the rape charge. It, 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 and it really is surprising to me that his own defense attorney is holding a rape charge that he was not found guilty of and that was ultimately dismissed. And he is arguing here today that that rape charge is the reason that he should spend the rest of the time. And I, I, I don't think that's true. There is a reason that the, the rape charge was dismissed. But they could have continued to prosecute it. I know. If any of my family members were a victim of a charge like that, I would still want to prosecute. I don't care that he's already been sentenced. I would still be pressing that he should be truly prosecuted. I think that the fact that it was dismissed shows that they were looking for the easiest and quickest way to have him sent away. He has done more. There is not anything else that he could have done since he's been incarcerated. He's had one write up in 2009. Over the 22 years that he's been in Angola, which is impressive in and of itself, he has worked a plethora of jobs. He's worked in the governor's range. He's been allowed to work at the rifle range around guns. He has been giving the most trust that any inmate in the facility could be given. He's a class A trustee. He was even authorized to go off of Angola's campus to do different HVAC. The guy concerts. in the blue suit is getting ready to go to sleep. Both so of them. I, I believe that all of this weighs heavily in the favor that he has learned. A lot over the past four years. He is not the same person he is. He has learned how to cope with his anger. He's learned how to deal with this greatness. And I, I believe that he deserves another chance. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. All right. You know, the attorneys have a choice. They can sit in Angola next to their client or they can be in the same room as a parole board. I guess he was playing it safe and being in the same room. <laughs> oh damn so was... you just called them out <laughs> <laughs> but i mean i thought his final statements were interesting he was kind of digging at ricky swift again and he also made some good points he has one write up in angola arguably the toughest prison in in, in the u.s um and i mean that's to, to to not be fighting there and to be trusted around the shooting range and all those things it was, I thought it was a good argument. And he said, you know, he, he had six witnesses that he didn't do the crime. Two of them were out of state. He wanted them in the courtroom. This hit Ricky Swift was new to his case. It wasn't the same attorney that was assigned to it. I, I thought he put up a good case. One thing I don't agree with him about is where he said if he was guilty, they would have prosecuted him. We've seen in Louisiana, the DAs don't, they don't really care about uh, those type of cases like sexual assault. Um, they they don't care a lot. They, they, uh, they don't the hell. They don't like going to trial. They take plea deals. Oh, um, you mean the defendants long. don't like going to trial? No, the DAs. The, the I, I, I don't know for certain um, how often the defend the the def not the defendant. How often you're saying the victim or the defendant? The the DAs for for. The prosecutor, let's just the prosecutors, they for these type of deals, we often see we, we often see where they take plea deals. There's no trial, and they have between two year, six year. The most we've seen is like you know, there's just a lot of short sentences, plea deals. Interesting. Yeah. Because there's a lot that why. can go wrong. You can have mistrials. There's a lot of them are broken homes. Guaranteed can... sentences is what basically they want. They don't want to mess around. Yeah, they just like, yeah. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Mrs. Jackson. All right, Mrs. Spano. Um, yeah, I wrote on my note, we'll decide after the interview. Side after the end. I want to hear you, want to see you, want to 
see how you react to things. Um, I'm impressed by the fact that a person who has had so many issues with anger in the past and has spent uh, your incarceration in Angola and you only have one white out. And that wasn't even for fighting or anything related to anger. And to me, that was impressive. You only had one write up. Your institutional record is good. And you had very positive comments uh, from your evaluators. You had very important, uh, very positive comments from the maintenance uh, department. Uh, and so, my vote would be to uh, grant your request and recommend communication since 99 years. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. I'm sorry, Thank Ms. You, Jackson. Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, I am Mr. For Spano, uh, I've listened Thank intently you. to uh, what you had to say, and uh, I've been in the criminal justice system for 50 years, so I, I understand how trials work. I understand how Defendants and public defenders often have conflicts and uh, lawyers want, uh, defendants want them to do more than, than perhaps what the lawyer can do. So I can understand how that was a, a disagreement. Uh, they did drop the rape charge. Uh, uh, don't know why, as Judge Jackson said, don't know why they dropped it. Maybe uh, because uh, they were going to get you with with, uh, with this charge, uh, but they tried you for this charge as opposed to the rape charge. The rape charge was that strong, it seems to me, they would try to that. But that's just my opinion. Uh, you made an uh, uh, excellent presentation today. An uh, excellent I think presentation. A good prison record. Uh, my vote, likewise, would be to recommend the governor that he can get you sentenced to 99 years. Mr. Freeman. Uh, Thank I, you, Mr. Merlo. Colleagues, and I also vote to commit you sentenced to 99 years. All right, Mr. Spano, for all the reasons that have already been stated, my vote is the same. So on your behalf, sir, we're going to make that recommendation to the governor that your sentence be commuted to 99 years. Again, not released, Thank but no longer life in prison, only 99 point. years. Well, what, what, yeah, so I what know. it means, if, if the governor signs it, then it, it, it makes him, I think, immediately eligible for parole. And then he has a parole hearing, which is... 99.9 .9%, like uh, it's a shoe in i've only seen i think one case where after the governor signs a commutation that they deny um oh wow well well you think about it, the the governor not the gov governor nominates the commutation board so if the commutation board recommends the governor the governor signs it and then the same board denies it he'd be like what are you doing so I mean, look, I I have no ill will towards this man. Obviously, I I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't have. Um, I wish uh, Spano nothing but the best, but let's just say I don't have a lot of hope. If you were to ask for my personal opinion, I pray that I'm completely wrong. But what I also know is that I read people for a living, so. Just the vibe that I'm getting. I, I hope I'm completely off the beaten path and I'm completely wrong. But w why is that? He, he He's in Angola. He has one write-up. Now, that's not an easy feat in all the years that he's been there. Mm -hmm. He's uh, excelled in prison. He's, you know, trusted. He's, you know, he's doing, he did everything uh, that he possibly could do to succeed. So why you know what do you think is going to happen when he gets out that he couldn't he's going to go back to his old ways and i'll tell you why i feel this way when you're in prison you don't have access to freely to access alcohol you don't have uh, the freedom to access drugs you don't have the freedom to go well, not from necessarily point a to point B. It's, it's it, there, there are plenty of people. It, well, let me um, finish. Let yeah. me finish. I'm saying like uninhibited free access whenever, wherever, for the most part. Okay. You can't argue with that point. I don't think it's harder to get your hands on it, but if you want it, you'll get it. Not my point, the freedom of access, but that's not the main point. When you're in prison 
when you're you're basically in an environment psychologically you have your routine you have your space you know it's familiar you create certain patterns certain new patterns begin to emerge alcoholics anonymous treatment programs you know maybe more religious work whatever you got to do right to survive upon release what happens why do a lot of people like drug addicts for example who are clean for years in prison the minute they get out they overdose and die well or just go back to their old ways if they don't overdose and die the problem is you are released back into the environment where you don't have those training mechanisms AA did not exist in your, let's say, home environment, in your backyard. So you're going back to the environment where the triggers of previous events are now coming back. It's all a psychological uh, hive, if you will, or like plotting dots on a graph, right? So you have at a, at a centerpiece, you have the prison and then here you have AA and you have church and you have hard work and you have dedication and all of this. Now, when you're released physically to an environment that is home, that is friends and violence and drugs and alcohol and all of this, you need to transfer this dot map, if you will, over to the new environment and that's not an easy feat um especially if you have a history and this man clearly has a history and again i wish him nothing but the best again i'm not like i said i have zero uh interest in 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 having this man fail i hope he succeeds but from what i have seen and the way he the way he talked about his plan of action once he gets out, it's there's no concreteness. It's all very vague. It's I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Like a man who has his plan talks like this. When I get out, if I get out, when I get out, my plan is I'm going to do AA three days a week, every day at 6 p.m. at the church. I already have a plan of action in place. See, now you're transferring all those data points that you learn in prison onto where you're headed. And on top of that, you know, Mondays and Wednesdays, my family and I are going to be going on a fishing trip or I don't know, like make it up. I'm making it up. Right. But when you're in prison, you have all the time in the world. You have a plan of action that you're going to create. Uh, in my mind, that would be the optimal way. Now, I'm not saying this is the only way, but I'm saying that's the way I foresee it uh, uh, happening again. Maybe it's too much. Maybe it's overbearing, but the chances of success and this is from a psychological standpoint. The chances of success, if you were to do that, are exponentially, infinitely higher because now you're transferring all those learned skills onto the new environment where you're about to be released, where those triggers are still the same triggers. It doesn't matter. 15, 20, 30 years later, they're going to trigger you whether you like it or not because that's just who you are. You haven't had a chance to practice those new skills in the non-controlled environment. Controlled environment, you got it to a T. But in the non-controlled environment, that's where you're going to have potentially going to have issues. So, again, I wish him nothing but the best. I hope he succeeds. I I got to go. <laughs> I didn't realize what time it was. <laughs> well, well, uh, on that case, I'll let, and it's fair. Recidivism rate is is. So I, I want to let you finish. If you have anything else to say, I don't want to just leave on that note. I pre the yeah, I mean the recidivism rate is is what it is because because you're right. It is really hard to get it. and and i've seen so many of these hearings um you're right it, it, many do come out with a very specific structure um and a plan and he didn't he didn't have that um i, I still kind of can't get over the fact that that he was sentenced to life because he had like three previous or four previous incidents including in school where he was throwing Even fisticuffs, not. right? These aren't weapon charges. These aren't, um, and he was given a life sentence without the chance of being free. And that seems wrong. Um, it just doesn't seem like justice to me. Being locked up for 20 years, and it might have been the best thing for him, like I think is is one of his relatives said. Um, and now it's up to him to to stay out of prison. But that's that's uh and also to believe that he was 
not guilty of committing the horrible crime he was accused of committing. Um, Which is apparently irrelevant to this equation because that was dismissed. Yeah. They're saying it's dismissed and then it's up to you whether you want to believe he was uh, guilty of it or not. He doesn't have a history of doing that. And, to, and you might argue someone would have a history of doing it. He doesn't um, have any sex write-up, offense write-ups in, in, in jail, which people who typically do when they have. So, I mean, there's a lot of um, uh, – but I, 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 I'm so grateful that you came on. Um, again, it means so much to me. For those of you who don't know, Larry was my hero – uh, and not all heroes wear capes, and um, and we we've been we we we've been in touch ever since. And and then he said, "Yeah, I'll jump on. Let's do it." So that was really great. Thank you. Well, it's because you built it up so much. I was getting ready <laughs> for this attorney to be like, "I know my client did it, and he's a scumbag, and you need to keep his ass in there for as long as he fucking rots." And I'm like, "Oh, I can't wait." <laughs> that, that, well, I, I'm sorry for being anticlimactic. That's how I saw it. I mean, I still saw an attorney that showed up 20 years later. Yeah. To make a statement, he took the Definitely time unusual. to write. Definitely unusual. I will and, give you that. I mean, we have seen people who have lost closest relatives show up and say, um, I've forgiven this person, board. You can let them out. And we've seen all different. So for someone who's – he was punched? I mean, I, I – I don't know. He I, wasn't I, just punched. He was left bleeding on the floor, <laughs> laying there in a pool of his own blood. And for weeks after that, he was suffering pain from the impact, Mandu. This wasn't just a, oh, you, you know, punch. This was like a, the, the court even called it. If you read the line, you can find it. You don't have to do it right now. But he, the court even said he used the weight of his body to make impact. This wasn't just a, you know, this was a freaking, you know, swing using the weight of his body to make a person bleed from the eye socket. This is no joke. This was an obvious, I need to do something and I need to do something now or else the trial will begin with this lawyer that I don't want. Yeah. I mean, the guy was a, uh... A practice fighter he could he probably from his history he, he definitely knew how to throw a punch but it also could have been that he was really believed he was innocent because he was and he spent two years in jail his family promised him an attorney they didn't get him one and then his attorney looks at him and says you're 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 gonna get you're gonna if you go to trial you're not only gonna get locked up but you're gonna be locked up for life and then he he's he has a hot temper. He's a fight. Boom. So that's a scenario too. Sure. The attorney made the mistake of not bringing his boxing gloves to the trial. <laughs> then he would have been he would have had to block it when it was coming his way. But right. anyway, on that note, I gotta go. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me, Mandu. Thank you guys. I love you all. I love my chat. I love Mandu's chat. This was cool. We were able to like do a collab you, and a, we're streaming it's called like simulcast or whatever where yeah we're streaming it's a on cool both. technology we have to do this more often yeah and i don't know how to stop it now <laughs> i'll do it I'll, I'll click the button i have the the the, the powers awesome all right all right man see you bye <laughs>